I like storytelling, whether it is on stage, on screen, or in real life, on real people. Wages in Serbia can be bigger than in Broadway, which is kind of crazy to me. Hello, and welcome to the Theatre Art Life podcast, sponsored by Harlequin Floors, the world leader in floors, stage systems, and studio equipment for the performing arts. Our podcast puts the spotlight on those who create live entertainment around the world, the culture creators, the backstage masters. My name is Anna Rock. And my name is Anna Aguilera. On this episode, Jelena and Panathia Rich talks with us about costume design. Yelena is a New York-based costume designer and educator. For the last 14 years, Elena has designed costumes for over 30 theatre, film and TV productions in the United States and her homeland, Serbia. Her costume design work has been awarded and exhibited multiple times. Yelena has worked in every role in the costume design field, costume designer and assistant, costume design and construction teacher and mentor, illustrator, costume shop manager, stitcher, first-hand, draper, embroiderer, craft artisan, costume painter, and distresser, dyer, dresser, and wardrobe supervisor for theatre, opera, dance, TV, and film. This experience enabled her to form a distinctive outlook on what it takes to put on a production from a costume perspective. In New York City, she mastered her craftsmanship skills through working as a craft artisan and costume maker for some of the best New York City costume shops and studios like Pass On Mares, John Christensen, Mio Design Studio, Jeff Fender, and Ballet Hispas Istanico. She created, embellished, distressed, and hand painted costumes and accessories for numerous Broadway, off Broadway, Disney, and HBO productions. Her defining wardrobe experience encompasses dressing metropolitan opera singers and dancers and wardrobe supervising the TV series Empires of Excess on the History Channel. She is currently a clinical assistant professor and costume supervisor at Pace University at Dyson College of the Arts and Sciences in New York City. Elena, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for inviting me. You have been busy. (laughs) Yes, I have been busy. (laughs) <laughs> that's it's I mean you've done so much so tell us like first of all um you were born in Serbia or are you born in the United States and then how did you get into costume and costume design generally so I was born in Belgrade Serbia and uh I've lived there for a majority of my life until I was 26 so yeah it's been an interesting journey I feel that I've always been interested in arts in the arts in general and also clothing and costumes Both of my parents uh, like to draw and uh, paint in their spare time whenever they did not go to work. And uh, that was very inspiring to me. I thought that they were really great artists. That was one of my main inspiration. And also my mom was really uh, crazy about fashion. Uh, She dressed really well. So that kind of was present in my family. Um, Those are some of the beginnings. And then later on, as I went to elementary school, I I kind of always had teachers that pushed me to do that, that kind of recognized my talent. So slowly, I was more and more focusing on art professionally and then costumes as well. So yeah, that I don't know. <laughs> what else would you like to hear in terms of my beginnings? So how do you bump into theater? I mean, I was exposed to theater since an early age. My parents did bring me to theater. I watched a lot of shows as a, as a kid and then um, later as I was growing up as well. But I also watched a lot of TV shows and films. And I was always attracted to the, to, to the storytelling and how storytelling can be enhanced from a visual perspective and also by designing uh, clothes for actors so I was kind of always attracted to, at the same time, to both theater and film and fashion. It was always hard for me to decide what is my biggest fashion, because I would always find uh, different ways how to express myself. And especially while I was still living in Serbia, I was practicing both costume design uh, and fashion. I feel like those are two different parts of my personality where I like storytelling, whether it is on stage, on screen, or in real life, on real people. And what would you say is like the difference between designing 
for fashion and designing for costume. I mean, I guess it's costume design is probably more a collaborative process and a fashion design is your vision as a as a beginning point. But what are the other differences? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. And you're absolutely right about the collaborative process. That's, I think, actually what I like the most about costume design. I really love that process of collaborating with the director, with other designers, with the set designer, with the lighting designer, even with the sound designer as well. And then even later on, going into production, working uh, with shop managers. For example, if I'm a costume designer and in that role, I love uh, working with the shop manager, with stitchers, with people who are making the costumes, with wardrobe people. So collaboration is truly an essential part of uh, costume design, but also kind of knowing people, knowing people's psychology in some way, uh, knowing how to read the room, learning how, what actors need at the moment, but also what they need in order to uh, do their best uh, work on stage as actors. So it's an interesting play between looking internally, looking uh, what you want to, how you see the script and how you see the storytelling, but also showing the, the, the director's vision and helping actors convey the story. So fashion is in that sense quite different because you're working more for a, let's say for a customer or um, for a consumer more precisely. And you're envisioning whether you're kind of trying to uh, imagine what are the situations where this garment is going to be worn or who is going to wear this garment. And that is usually, that usually depends on the brand or the company that you're working for. So there are some constraints like that. And whether you're designing for ready to wear or whether that's some custom tailoring for a specific uh, individual. So uh, it's it's a different approach for sure. And um, it's a different goal. But uh, what is similar about the two is working with fabrics, learning how fabrics work, how fabrics drape, uh, how they sit on a person, how they move, how the person uh, moves in this fabric and in this garment, and also the, the sketching part that's the same for both costume and fashion design. You always need to start with sketching to start any design process. And then the next step is swatching or looking for fabrics uh, to match your sketch and your idea. And then later on, working with people who are going to construct the garment. So those are some similarities, I would say. So it's more like of the there's that's the process that's similar. I mean, but I have to say I never worked as a fashion designer for um let's say for companies. I so I was sort of like working with my uh peers or I I co-founded the brand uh, with the classmates from my uh college uh, of fine arts in Serbia where we all had focus in fashion and costume design. So we were, let's say there was there were 10 of us. The brand still exists. The name is Klasa. And uh, yeah, I'm not the part anymore of that, but we were our own bosses, let's say. So we didn't work for someone else. That was that's the difference. I, I haven't experienced that part of fashion design. And then there's the 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 differences, I guess, within the the entertainment realm between theater and opera and dance you know, TV and film, I guess, again, the differences immediately that sort of stand out are that, you know, with TV and film, you might have to be a little bit more attention to detail because it's so, people are, the camera's close, right? And then in, uh, do you feel like theatre, opera and dance, you can, it's a bit more of a remove, so you can go for the bigger aesthetic. But is, do you have a, do you have a, a favourite sort of in that realm that you, that you lean towards that you really enjoy or do you enjoy all, all disciplines? This is going to sound terrible, but I enjoy all disciplines. And uh, maybe it's, uh, I feel like I get easily bored and I need constant, um, I need to be activated nonstop. And that's why I explored all these different forms of expression. I love, I really love live performance. There's nothing like li live performance and seeing everything in person. And it was really hard uh, 
when the COVID pandemic started and I was in New York at that time, um, when all the theaters shut down, I realized how much I was missing that direct contact, you know, with the, with the actors, with the design team, with the makers, with technicians, with everyone. So I really miss the collaborative part. Uh, film is a little bit, I feel like film bounced back way more quickly than, than the theater. And I did kind of like, as I was, as we were going out of the pandemic, you know, the TV was one of the first things that I came back to. So it's good to know that that's, that that's always going to be there, even though if God, you know, if anything like this happen again, we know that that will, you know, the film, there will always be filming. Uh, so that's great. And I do love the attention to detail for sure. What I personally never, never liked about film are the hours or like on the film sets. That's quite exhausting. They can, you literally have no personal life when you're working on a film project. It's from early morning until late at night and then you go to sleep and then barely <laughs> and then you get up and there's another day and another day while you're there is amazing, but it can be quite hard on the body. It's really, especially as you are growing older, I feel like, and a lot of colleagues that I have, uh, they're also saying the longer they're in the field that it's really harder to stay because of that. But it's it's much, it's uh, better paid than theater for sure. Mm. Yeah. I, I feel, let's put it this way, what I maybe do not enjoy as much. Um, I don't think I enjoy being driven to a location. And then be, I, I sometimes can feel stuck there if I'm there for like 12 hours or something like that. I like the freedom to leave and come back or like, you know, if I want to grab lunch elsewhere and not have what I'm given. So I feel like I'm less maybe flexible in that sense or like I like more. Uh, I never felt like that in theater, but um, yeah, I don't know. I think it depends on the person. Can you tell us a little bit about what brought you to New York City from Serbia and and also maybe the differences between working in Serbia and working in, in America? So I didn't go straight to New York from, from Belgrade. I actually got offered a scholarship to study uh, the master's program uh, in costume design and technology at the University of Connecticut. Um, so that's where I went in um, 2014 and I was there until I graduated in 2017. So during that time I traveled to New York whether to see you know exhibits or just for networking to meet as many people as possible in the industry. And then I realized that um, like New York is not that far from where I was uh, studying so it was maybe three and a half hours or so, sometimes longer if you're traveling by bus, um, but it was manageable to go and travel. And I realized that most of the people that I knew and that I met, whether they were uh, costume designers or uh, artists in general, they were either relocating to New York or they were already already living in New York. And uh, I realized that I already have, by the end of my studies, I already sort of like had some sort of community that I could uh, join to that was really important to me and that uh, I mean there's a huge market there's a lot of jobs uh, in theater in general in New York there's a lot of opportunities so I knew that uh, I will always be able to find something um, in the field I just yeah and I also love the city I love the energy I love the diversity different cultures I love the access to all the exhibits and all the art. Yeah, I, I in general, coming from Belgrade, New York uh, felt very similar in terms of the energy, even with like higher energy and more things to explore and learn about. Like I'm currently now visiting uh, my family in Serbia and it's really nice to be back. I actually haven't been living in Serbia for the last uh, eight years or so. So I can't speak uh, about the most recent years or what is the you know theater scene from my own perspective I can say what I hear from uh, my colleagues and I can talk about my experience from before 
when I was working here. So I, I kind of started working professionally still while I was in college in Serbia. That was 2008. That was my third year um, into um, my program. Started working on uh, student productions for both the theatrical productions and the uh, film productions. And I was as I was slowly graduating and finishing this program, I started working for more professional theaters, professional projects, also for TV. Uh, and that's where I also started uh, working on the fashion brand at the same time. So that all kind of was happening simultaneously. And uh, it was quite exciting. Uh, I was still kind of figuring my way there. And I was also trying to figure what I like better. Probably one of the most exciting things that happened was this designing a magic flute for the opera company uh, Madlenianum in Belgrade. That was uh, quite a big project and uh, where I uh, designed for established opera singers for this great opera. Um, and uh, I, I had a good budget. I had the access to the costume shops and costume makers, also shoemakers, uh, people who made the uh, dresses for me. And that sort of collaboration was really exciting because I was hopping from one studio, from one shop to another and kind of coordinating all of that, all of the builds. Um, also, I, I was shopping the pieces that couldn't be built. And that was, uh, I have to say, I've, I'm not sure if I was quite prepared for the size of the project. It was kind of just thrown at me uh, because I was still like a young emerging designer, kind of fresh uh, from college. And this was a, a big, big opera piece. But I guess when you're younger, uh, there's, um, I don't know, you you fear less of new things and you're just excited to try everything. Um, so that's probably one of my most exciting experiences as a costume designer. And then later on, maybe um, when I worked on TV for a, for a big uh, TV show called The First Voice of Serbia, that's kind of similar to The X Factor. Maybe I could compare that to that which was working um, on the looks for, for the dancers for each of the songs. And then also working backstage. That was quite, that was also one of the bigger projects that happened right away. So I was, that, was, that all happened within three years um, upon my graduation in Serbia. So it was quite uh, strange that I decided three years into this to relocate and start all over again in a new country, new program. I wasn't sure whether I wanted to leave that because I was really kind of gaining a momentum. Uh, but I think it was still a, a good choice to try something new and, and see how, how this works uh, in, the U in the U.S. and also New York. And then, yeah, I can say a little bit what's the difference. I kind of like <laughs> talked a lot about the uh, work in Serbia. Well, I think the main difference would be maybe, um, especially in New York, uh, People tend to do different things within the costume industry, like the uh, same person would design and make costumes and do the wardrobe, like same old things that you listed that I did in, uh, in my career. That's quite normal uh, in the States. Not for everyone, but I would say for majority of costume people. And that, that's, I think that's good because you get to gain all these different skills and you become better as a designer, you became better as a technician. Uh, if you know all the aspects of the, you know, costume design. Uh, in Serbia, I feel it's still more costume design designs. The stitcher stitches the costumes, the tailor tailors the costumes, the wardrobe person will always be the wardrobe. And there's rarely jumping, like, uh, from one thing to another. It's it's starting to happen more and more from what I'm hearing. So that that's also becoming more similar. Yeah, that that's one of the 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 things that kind of stuck to me. But what's similar, I would say, is that uh, it can sometimes be hard uh, to be seen as something else. For example, if you start taking on wardrobe work, people will see you both in the U.S. and in Serbia as a wardrobe person. Not nothing bad to say about wardrobe. Wardrobe being in wardrobe is an amazing experience. But it's, for example, if you decide that you're more interested maybe in crafts or to be a, a designer, that's going to be harder to make that move because pe people perceive the industries are not that big in terms of the amount of people that are working and kind of 
very soon you learn who's where, who's working on what kind of projects, who's in what roles. So it's a little harder to convince people in, in different things, but it's possible. I, I, I did it and I, I've been doing it for a while. And yeah, I think another thing are probably the size of the, there's way more productions in the States, uh, uh, like both in New York and uh, then, in, then in Serbia. But, and then what happens with that is that the more you have more productions, you also have more uh, design programs, costume design and technology programs. So you have more people coming out of college ready to work which also means that uh, there are more people that are willing to work for lower wages in the States just for the sake of getting that job. So the wages actually can be lower in the States uh, very often than in Europe or in Serbia, which is quite uh, a paradox, I think. Uh, even like I, I talked to my mentor from Serbia, uh, Liljana Petrovic, who is, uh, as an who's an established uh, film costume designer and she told me that wages in Serbia can be bigger than on Broadway, which is kind of crazy to me. <laughs> it's, it's, um, and then you have also, you know, the rent in New York and in general in, in the States is crazy. Uh, currently, uh, Manhattan is having the high is having the highest rent ever, average rent. So just to think that the the wages are so low uh, or the, per project, and the rent is astronomical high the math is not really working that's why maybe people are rarely doing just one thing people are are rarely just designers because designer fees are really not, are not that great especially mm. for costume designers and now a moment for our sponsor the theater art life podcast is proud to be sponsored by harlequin harlequin is the world leader in floors stage systems and studio equipment for the performing arts Established in the UK over 40 years ago, Harlequin is the preferred performance floor for the world's most prestigious dance and performing arts companies, theatres and schools. From the Royal Opera House to the Bolshoi Theatre, the New York City Ballet to the Royal New Zealand Ballet. Harlequin's experience and reputation are founded on the development, manufacture and supply of a range of high quality sprung and vinyl floors specifically designed for dance and the performing arts. Backed by an engineering team and independent research, Harlequin also designs, builds and refurbishes stages working with stage engineers and theatre consultants in leading venues across the world. Harlequin is the global leader in its field with offices in Europe, the Americas and Asia Pacific. Find out more at harlequinfloors.com, H-A-R-L-E-Q-U-I-N floors.com. That's really interesting to get that insight and thank you for sharing with us that because I think what is always interesting is when we're comparing industry for industry and, and, and like you said, people hold Broadway as that iconic place to work in and but then at the same time if you're not getting paid adequately enough to live in it, like that's that's just a, a hard thing to come to terms with. I kind of want to ask, it, you know, I always get fascinated as a designer, like where do you get your inspiration from or what do you look for when you're trying to get ideas that to bring into the costume design? How do you see the world that brings what's in your brain out to life in a costume? The approach is kind of different every time with every new piece, I would say. Uh, what's always the same is reading the script analyzing the script so doing that sort of like getting into really the, the text and figuring out what is if, if it's a play what is the play about who is the writer when was this written so you figure out what is the time frame what is the place where this is happening um, if it's a period piece so first starting with the uh, you know facts and things that are given Usually a lot of designers and, and myself uh, start to do also the technical part, which is also a costume plot, which is which also actually help later design. So it's like tracking uh, costume changes for each of the characters. As the character is moving from scene to scene, you're tracking if it's mentioned in the, in the script, what is this person wearing? What is the season? Is it summer? Is it autumn? You know, what well, is it inside? Is it outside? So all of these uh, details, getting all, all of these details. And then I like once I nailed that down, I really try to start to do sort of like set the world of the play, try to figure out uh, I acquire as many images 
and visuals as possible. And then I narrow down these images um, that speak to me and that I feel convey the atmosphere and the mood of the script. And then later on, that gets refined even more as I'm meeting with the director and other designers. And as I hear what the director wants the, to convey, what is the main theme, what is the main focus, that helps me go even deeper and to get uh, to even like finer research that, I, that I'm sharing. I like to share my research right away and get feedback on it because, again, it's a collaborative process. Um, and sometimes even it happened that some of the directors are more visual than the others. The directors would also sometimes share the visuals. And then I kind of try to meet in the middle, see what they're attracted to, try to read their visuals and my visuals and meet in the middle. And then you start with, you know, then you continue actually with uh, doing pre preliminary sketches, rough kind of sketches. And again, uh, showing it to the director, talking about the sketches with the director, starting to do some more practical research, like uh, maybe going to stores, searching online, looking for fabrics or swatches with the assistant, or maybe you have a shopper. So you're working with them as well. They're helping you get to more, you know, concrete designs. And then as you acquire all of these things, you're you're going towards the final sketches or renderings. And um, yeah, the, the process is not done there, but that's a uh, big chunk of uh, the pre-production work, which helps later. Um, and that really depends on each production. It's different for the dance production. You know, it's different if it's a devised theater piece that is way more collaborative, where you also collaborate with actors. So you are... Uh, they also sometimes can have input in your costume designs, but you can also have input into like props that are not even costumes. So it really depends on, on each uh, project. So yeah, that's that's a very, that's probably one of my favorite parts because uh, I feel like a lot of designers, especially costume designers, would say that sketching is their favorite part. But I think in my case, I really enjoy working with people. I feel like I'm a really like a people's person and uh, I like to really meet who these people are To I like to research first before even I meet the person like do the online research who is this person that I'm going to work with uh, what kind of work did this person do whether it's a director or uh, you know a costume maker so I can understand what are the strengths of each of, of uh, these collaborators and maybe what they're attracted to and then as we meet either first on Zoom or in person, also just continuing this uh, sort of like continuing to meet the person, uh, who this person is, also reading the room, you, you will learn a lot about different characters and you learn that not everyone likes to do. People are actually very particular about each thing and you kind of have to figure that out really quickly because the timelines can be short you have to understand really quickly and you have to communicate in a really um, direct way what you are attracted in some play, let's say if it's a play or a musical that you're working on, and then also, but also ask questions what this other person is attracted to. Even if it's like uh, a draper, let's say, or a stitcher, I like to ask what a draper likes to, what kind of garment the draper likes to drape. So, so that also helps my design process because I never want to hire someone or work who, who is unhappy with some, someone that someone is making. Um, I mean, that can also go a different way. If you're hiring someone for a specific design, that can go the other direction as well. But in general, I even, and I realized that even more while working uh, at Pace University and working with students, I have a lot of uh, costume student aides that are also working in the costume shop as costume makers. I try to figure out what is each person's passion and uh, try to give as much as that kind of work to, to the person uh, because then everyone are happy if you give someone to work thing that's going to make miserable the other person. The product, for the process is not going to be good. The result is not going to be probably good. So I don't know. It's um, I feel like a lot of in working with people, you have to realize what are what people what are people's passions and how you communicate your passions and how 
you all enjoy how you create a really enjoyable working environment. So you want to go back there every day, I think. <laughs> That's a good answer. Uh, do you have any de time to design now that you're working at the um, Dyson College of the Arts or is that pretty much a full-time gig now? It's a pretty much a full-time gig, but I managed actually to design some of the shows uh, also for Pace University. Um, it was a musical If Then uh, that opened at Michael Schimmel Center for the Performing Arts in, uh, when was that, uh, March, April? It was quite a lot uh, because I'm also a costume supervisor there and teach class classes and mentor students. Designing was, was quite challenging because of the lack of time. But then I really, I had an amazing uh, assistant who then became a co-designer because uh, he helped me a lot. That, that's a student at Pace University. Um, He started as an assistant and I kind of upgraded. We talked about this. I realized that he made such a great contribution to the to this musical that he he should be considered as a co-designer because it was really a collaborative project. No matter that I'm his professor, like we we really worked hard on this. Yeah, that, that was quite a challenging. And also the other thing why this was very challenging, because uh, there was um uh, an insane amount of costume changes in this musical that needed to happen really quickly because the show is about uh, switching um, character switches. So it's called, uh, you know, if then, or, but essentially it's like, what if life can be different? So in one life, she is a one person. In a different life, she is a different person. So I needed to convey different characters within seconds. So, for example, she just like the, the actress wouldn't even leave the stage uh, to change the costume, but she would have to, to change on stage and convey a different character. So that that was uh, uh, quite challenging. Um, but I, I enjoyed it. It was it was great. Uh, and I in general, I like to work for productions in uh, educational settings because I like the the teaching, the educational moment with uh, working with students, uh, with people who are just starting. I like that sort of exchange. And I feel that I'm also learning a lot from students and having that fresh perspective. Sometimes that's really helpful. But other than that, I feel like um, recently I haven't really, I've been working mostly in educational settings as a designer. I worked for some other schools in New York. And we'll see, maybe maybe next year, um, as I'm, I'm currently hiring a, an assistant. So I think that's going to be a huge help uh, in the shop for me and at the university. So who knows, maybe I go back more to designing as well outside the university. We'll see. <laughs> That's cool. I think you, you've said what is like your most sort of, you know, like the favorite thing about the job is the collaboration. And on the flip side, is there anything about the industry or the job that you would change if you could? And if so, what would that be? Absolutely. <laughs> I would change a lot of things, actually. Oh, I don't know what well, where to begin. Um, well, well, it's actually nice that there's a lot of conversation about this, these things, and they started uh, even before the pandemic, but even more so during the pandemic, because I feel people had more time to think about uh, these things that that are you know tr troubling in our industry. I would say there's a lack of work life balance because the the wages are so small in theater, and you constantly have to hustle. Especially if you're a freelancer, you constantly have to network, reach out to people, uh, make uh, you know decisions nonstop whether you're accepting the project, this or that project. In a lot of cases, you choose to do something just because it's paid more and not necessarily because you want to do it. First thing that I would do, I would increase the the wages in theater, uh, especially, or just at least it's still crazy to me that costume designers are paid less than set designers and lighting designers. That still hasn't changed. Um, even like stitchers and costume construction people are paid less than carpenters, than any people working, um, making the sets. So that that's, that's the number one. And the number two, I feel are the hours and that the, the balance that I mentioned very often You work, you know, the the entire day. The shows are usually happening at night. They're often happening on the weekends. They're they're almost always happening during the holidays. So you rarely have time to visit family. 
hang out with friends. Uh, that's that's a really hard part. And that's also what makes me question uh, very often, do I still want to do this? Because Or like, how do I find that balance better? How do I fight for bigger wages? Especially when you're in a bigger mar- market like the US, where there's always going to be someone who will accept the lower wage. And I really, t- I would like to tell to a- every costume person, don't accept to work for $300 for $500. That's just ridiculous. Like, even if you're a starting designer, because then you're setting that, you're setting everyone for for failure. Mm. You're screwing everyone up with with that. The whole industry. Yeah, because it's like a domino effect. I don't know. (laughs) Then everyone are going to be paid less. Uh, And then producers are going to be, oh, I guess if this person is, going to work for this then i can do this the next time and maybe even try with less money and same thing i would say for the costume budgets if you want to it's interesting that it's always expected to have a great quality you know um to have this amazing costumes you know change costume changes for each of the character and all that and the budget doesn't allow for that Mm. so there's there's that constant battle uh, you know, saying like, okay, that's great, but I need a bigger budget to achieve this look. Uh, the math usually does not work, or you you have to like figure out alternative ways. Uh, a lot of way, yeah, yeah. The third important thing is, I think a lot of costume designers in the U.S. spend their own money. Uh, they're not given a head, like let's say a credit card or and some sort of like a costume budget ahead. But they spend their own money or like on their own credit card and then they get reimbursed. But you never know, you know, it's very, why would you use your own money? It's not your project. You're working for someone else. So that needs to be changed, I think, as well. Yeah, I, you know, I've had a a number of conversations with uh, producers or whatever who've seen a costume budget and they're like, well, why is it that much? It's like, well, costumes cost money. Like, it's a, it's not this, like, you can't, you know, you can't make a costume for 50 bucks. Like, you, you need some decent cash if you want something unique and quality. And I think always people get quite surprised when they see the costume budget, but then, and it's one of the first things they'll try to drive down. And it's, it's a, it's an interesting sort of, perception from people that it shouldn't cost much but it does you know <laughs> you know it's like oh it's people clothes you can bring the actor can bring something from the wardrobe I'm like no that's yeah not that's it. not really how it works <laughs> <laughs> but uh, helena thank yeah. you so much for joining us today and sort of you know sharing your work and your life and and it's really really fascinating to dig into the the costume world and we need more of you advocating for you know good quality conditions and pay and I wish you all the best uh, in the future. And just one other thing, you know, if people are looking to see your work or connect with you, how would they do so? There's an email. I think that's the best way. So it's uh, my name, which is J-E-L-E-N-A dot half of my last name, which is A-N-T-A-N-A-S at gmail.com. My last name is long. I get confused sometimes too. Yeah, and there, there's a, I have a website, which is also my first and last name, Yelena Antonasievich. Uh, it's hard for spelling. That's the only bad part. We'll put it in the link in the, the podcast by, so don't worry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. I, I was really happy to be here and share. And yeah, I'm always happy to share my experiences and hopefully they can be helpful to someone who listens. Thank you. Theatre at Life is a global media site for entertainment. Memberships start at only 38 US dollars per year. You can have unlimited access to our daily published articles, including entertainment news and the writings of active industry professionals, ensuring that you are always up to date on the global happenings in the world of entertainment. Become a part of the international entertainment community and join us now at www.theatreartlife.com.